That was some good worship. Come on, let's, let's thank you, Jesus, for independence in worship. Man. Wow, that was good. Well, hi, good morning. I'm not, I don't quite have my uh, brain on yet, so I've been down there worshiping the Lord and got lost in it. Um, this is, we're, we're coming out of a full month on sort of missions and uh, sharing with you all the ways that the 10% that we give um, goes, and it was, it's been overseas missions, and then we've lend, uh, ended with some of the more local uh, missions, and one of those is our in-house um, sort of evangelism tool where we just share, share Jesus and serve coffee. So if you want to become a trucker, if you want to serve or roast or get out in our schools, we give back and just say thank you to anyone and everyone in our city um, who is serving. That's what we do. Amen. Now, before I jump in um, to where we're heading, there's two important um, holidays that I know of this week. Um, the first of which is July 4th. I've seen some people with some red, white, and blue. I've seen some American flags. Um, so I, I wanted to just take a moment and acknowledge if there's anyone in our midst who has served in the military, would you be so kind as to stand? We just want to acknowledge you. And then as they're standing, if there's anyone in our midst. Stay standing for just a minute. If there's anyone else in our midst who has lost a brother or a sister or a son or a daughter who is not standing, would you stand that have lost in active military service? I know of at least two families in our midst. I don't know if they're here. Well, we just want to say to all of you, we are grateful and we do not take for granted the freedoms that we get to experience and that we get to stand in a public middle school and preach and proclaim the name of Jesus is a testament to your service. So, thank you. <laughs> the second uh, major day that I am aware of is probably one that you are not aware of. It happened on June 29th. Any ideas? June 29th is the day that Rome says the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter were killed. And if I took you there for a minute because we're in the book of Acts and we're studying the life of Saul, the way I would take us there before we open our, our Bibles this morning is to say that most likely the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter were killed June 29th of 67 A.D., or CE if you prefer. There's almost nothing known about Paul's final trial beyond that he suffered the charge of treason against the Roman emperor who was Nero. Simon Peter and the apostle Paul were likely in a prison cell together for nine months before they were executed on the very same day. Peter was nailed to a cross. He was not a Roman citizen, and at his own request, he was actually um, twisted upside down on the cross, and he was head, head down, feet in the air, and uh, he was part of Nero's sort of circus that was on display at the Vatican. Paul, because he was a Roman citizen, was beheaded in a far less public place, the ancient tradition of Paul's execution site is almost certainly authentic, but the details cannot be confirmed. And whereas if we took you to Jerusalem this morning, we could walk down the Via Della Rosa, the very place where King Jesus would have taken the cross and walked through Jerusalem, uh, through the city gates, onto a hill right outside the city gates where he was crucified, almost nothing is known about how Paul or how he journeyed to the place where he was executed, and I think he would have had it no other way. I think he would have uh, wanted us and wanted to be remembered because he walked with Christ. Christ walked with him down that road. There is no Via Della Rosa. Christ was actually walking with him and in him, and he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But they would have marched on that particular day, most likely 
through the walls, past the Pyramid of Cestus. They would have gotten onto the Ostian Way in Rome. Some of you have just actually been to Rome. But they would have journeyed uh, down that way, and they would have had an execution squad with them, Roman officers who had rods that they would have used to beat Paul, possibly, and axe. And then during the day of Nero, they actually beheaded people with a sword. And this was thought to be a, a more uh, humane way of dying than the way Peter died as a public spectacle on a cross. So Paul was a chained criminal walking stiffly in chains and filthy and dirty from his prison cell, but he would not have been ashamed. He would not have been degraded. He was going to a feast. He was going to a triumph. It was the crowning day to which he had pressed forward. He had often talked of it and God's promise of eternal life in Jesus that this was not a day to fear. He believed God had promised and spoken that all God's promises find their yes in him. No executioner was going to lose him to the conscious presence of King Jesus. He was not changing his company, the person with whom he journeyed. He was only changing the place in which he enjoyed the presence of that company. Those glimpses that he had of King Jesus, the Damascus Damascus Road in Jerusalem at Corinth on the sinking ships, now he was going to see his Jesus face to face, no longer beholding him dimly, but knowing him intimately present and in person. And they would have marched Paul on that particular day down the Ostian Way to a little pine glade, a piece um, uh, where there would, would have been tombs and what's now known as Trey Fontaine. There's a little abbey that's now there in his honor, and it is believed that he was probably put in a tiny little cell where he was kept overnight, and I can only imagine, but if they knew in Jerusalem what was about to happen, then Luke, Dr. Luke, who penned this book of Acts, would have made the journey, and I can imagine that if Dr. Luke was there on that day, he would have been outside the cell and and probably leaning in and talking to his brother, the Apostle Paul, and if Timothy and if John Mark could have made that journey, they probably did. And I imagine that as they were sitting there on the night before that Paul died, they were not griping, they were not moaning, they were not fussing, they were not crying, but they were probably singing absolute hymns of triumph. And they were probably praising Jesus for the life that Paul had lived. They may have been asking God to deliver him, but they knew that the greatest deliverance is actually the stepping from this life into eternity. And that God had known this man, the Apostle Paul, in person, but now Jesus, he was going to know him face to face. That shroud would no longer separate. And they, the soldiers would have come, executioners would have come and gotten him at dawn, and they would have taken him out and laid him on his knees, and they would have stripped him down, and the executioner would have raised the sword. And I can only imagine that the pa- Apostle Paul, as he was sitting there and waiting and watching with perhaps his friends up over the hill or wherever, and the sword is raised, he is singing or saying, for me to live is Christ and to die is And off goes his head, and he enters glory. And he is welcomed, no doubt, as one of the greatest generals in the army of God that this world has ever seen. And I can only imagine that in that moment when that sword went down and the Apostle Paul entered glory, that there was probably a standing ovation in heaven from King Jesus all down to the host of the angel armies. And they all stood and they probably would have given Paul a standing ovation as he entered into paradise. Amen. We should probably just go home now. (laughs) As I study this, what I want to do this morning is I want to back up and I want to ask the question, how does God shape his leaders? How does God shape his people? How does God choose um, when someone like Paul is going to minister powerfully under the gospel of King Jesus? How does God shape them? um, And how does he help them shape them so that they can finish the race, go the distance, and end well? And I want to, we're not going to read Genesis 37 to 
42, but if you're taking notes, I'd invite you to write that down and read it. That's the account of Joseph. And I'm going to pull four principles uh, from the life of Paul here in Acts that we're about to read and from the life of Joseph. We're going to make a parallel here with how God shapes his people and the ones that he wants to use powerfully. And then I'm going to invite you to uh, make a pivot and begin to look at your own life and go, how is God shaping me? That's right. That's right. Man, I threw you in the deep end this morning, didn't I? I love the Apostle Paul. He's one of my favorites and uh, genuine till the end. So here's where we're heading then as we, uh, we're into um, Acts 9. I'm going to read verse 19 to 31. Um, and I want to set a couple things just as we uh, open our Bibles this morning. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, a famous theologian, he actually said, the worst thing that can happen to someone is to succeed before they're ready. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the worst thing that can happen to someone is to succeed before they're ready. King Jesus always emphasizes the transformed heart and the transformed life that is walking in surrender to his lordship and in accordance with his will and his way. When that, when that heart posture, one of surrender to his lordship, will, and way, is at play, the kingdom of God is not only near, but it's, it's really fully actualized. Oftentimes, especially in this day and age, uh, people will exercise um, spiritual gifts. And I need you to know something. We're not going to do a study on this, but I think this is very important as we look at the four ways that God shaped Paul. But people will exercise uh, spiritual gifts, and those spiritual gifts are actually irrevocable. Romans eleven twenty nine. 29, if you want to look it up. So when God gives a gift, guess what he never does? takes it back. Now, so a human can often stand up and in the strength of their gifting, they can do wonderful things or even great things, um, not under the power of the Spirit, but it can amass a following and a group of people. And at times, that human may not have the character or the deep inner formation to carry the weight of what they're now leading. You follow me? And that's why we see these cataclysmic, especially within the church in the last few years of many denominations and many different places, where there are these massive falls from grace, if you will. There's things that are exposed. And what I really have sought in my own journey, because it's very humbling for me to even say and acknowledge I'm a pastor in this day and age. In some places, I would actually even say to you, it's actually scary. Because at, at the end of the day, my greatest desire is not to have the biggest or the shiniest or the coolest or the hippest church or the most campuses. Or I, I don't even care. What I want to do is to the end of my day, to the last moment when God has me cross the finish line into eternity is to be able to say that I did not lose my first love. I maintained that love relationship with the Lord Jesus, with my beautiful wife, Abby, with my children, with our church, and with whatever ministry he calls us to lead. And one of, I think, the great then questions for those of us who are in the church, not just professional pastors or Christians or people or whatever, but also for you is to be asking what then happened in the life and in the heart of the Apostle Paul that allowed him to not get his gifting um, ahead of his spiritual formation or the fruit of the Spirit or the character inside of him. You follow me? There's many Christians in this day and age that actually emphasize and even seek after the fruit of this or the gifts of the spirit, excuse me, and I will never downplay the gifts of the spirit. But what I will always do is say let us also elevate the fruit of the spirit and the formation of King Jesus inside of us that way we're not just seeking signs and wonders but we're actually seeking the giver of the signs and wonders and there's a full character of formation inside of us so that we can go the distance. I think it is important as we open our Bibles this morning and our quest to understand how did God form the Apostle Paul, how did God form even Joseph in the Old Testament, that the school of Elisha and Elijah, I'm going to throw some of you on your ear right here, and we're not going to go there, but the school of Elisha and Elijah in First and Second Kings never developed an Elisha or an Elijah. <laughs> 
Now, let me, I'm going to, you're going to have to follow me. And if you're new here, if you're not a Bible person, I'm throwing out all sorts of things. You're going to have to take some notes. If you're a doubter, if you're an atheist, welcome. Just join in. Here we are. We love Jesus. But the school of Elijah and Elisha in the Old Testament was actually a school of prophets. And we had all these young people that came into their school, the prophets, and they trained them to be prophets. But here was the problem. Never once did it produce an Elijah or an Elisha. Another more modern parallel is D.L. Moody. I love D.L. Moody, one of my heroes. He started the Moody Bible Institute and several Moody schools. They're amazing. But guess what they've never produced? A D.L. Moody. We could also look even more modern view of this. We have the Billy Graham Evangelical Association. I love Billy Graham. He's also one of my heroes. Proclaimed Jesus faithfully, finished well all the way to the end. Like, man. And yet, the Billy Graham Evangelical Association and the Cove and all the things that Billy has done, which were amazing, guess what they've never done? Come on. Produced a Billy Graham. So the question then becomes, as we wrestle this morning, is how then does God shape his generals? How then does God shape his people? How then does God shape us? And what can we sort of glean from and learn from it? Um, Even then looking at our own lives and beginning to understand the things that God might allow or purpose or cause. um, If we are able to sort of bow our knee and go, Lord Jesus, I don't understand and I don't like it, but I do acknowledge and admit that your word working this thing or that thing or what happened in my history for my good and for your glory if I'll bow my knee to it. Make sense? So, I think our God is interested in hearts that are so turned towards him that have so laid to rest their own ambitions, agendas, grandiose dreams, self-actualization, attainment, that they are seeking to know him. So not just to practice the gifts, but fully know the giver of the gifts um, and let all practice of such gifts uh, be the overflow of hearts that are fully enraptured and, and where Jesus has been fully formed inside of them. Does that make sense? If I took it a step further before we begin reading in Acts 9, 1 Kings 19, 12 says, After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a still, small voice. It's Elijah who's sitting in a cave, and he's scared, and he's running, and he doesn't know where God is. And there's a huge fire, and there's a huge wind, and there's a huge earthquake, and God's not in any of them. And all of a sudden, God comes in a still. I don't think that's an indicator of God's lack of power or lack of even grandiosity or glory, but it is an indicator, I think, of how God even speaks to us today. And to me, the ultimate goal is not that you have some dream or some vision or some encounter or some, all of that is good, and I would never downplay the gifts of the Spirit, but I want to upplay the fruit of the Spirit, the character of Jesus inside of you, and your ability to begin to abide in the fullness of his presence day by day, moment by moment, so that you can begin to hear his still small voice, align it up with Scripture, align it up with the people in our community, and then make Spirit-filled, empowered decisions from that place. Does that make sense? Okay. So even as a church, our goal is to lead people to Jesus, but it's also to help people with their inner life, character formation, the fruit of the Spirit, heart transformation that is conducive for a deep and abiding relationship with King Jesus. Okay, let's start reading. I'm in Acts 9, starting in verse 19. And we're going to go through 31, and we're going to talk about uh, the four ways God shaped Paul, here we go, Acts 9, 19. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. So he has been without food or drink for three days. Um, He's just had the Damascus Road experience. Um, And this is is an aside, but I want to say it. Um, God gives people Damascus Road experiences who are uniquely hard of heart. Okay? So if you are sitting out there and you're like, Michael, I've never had a Damascus Road experience. That's wonderful. Okay? I once 
uh, and I don't want to open this too far, but I once was very lost and very broken, and God showed up to me in a very powerful way. But he did it because I was unable to hear the still, small voice. You, you follow me? The goal is not that we live on these deep, huge, earth-shattering you know, uh, phenomenon and supernatural events. The goal is that we so are formed and we so know the Holy Spirit of Jesus that we are able to hear that still, small voice. So verse 19, after taking some food, he saw, he'd be called Paul later, so I kind of use the two interchangeably, uh, regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus, and at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, the synagogues are just where all the Jews met, right? So he walks into places where Jews meet, and there's a bunch of Pharisees and religious people, and he says, Jesus is the Son of God, and guess what they do? Oof, they're angry. Okay, verse 21. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name, meaning the name of Jesus. And hasn't he come here to take them as his prisoners to the chief priests? So Paul, actually Saul, went to Damascus with um, papers from the chief priests and from the great Sanhedrin to an arrest, torture, uh, and in some cases even kill um, Jesus followers. Verse 22, yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. So he's using the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He's using the Psalms, the Proverbs, and the prophets to prove, especially Isaiah, that Jesus is the Messiah. Verse 23, after many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him, but Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept a close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. Verse 25, but his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. So let's pause there before we go to verse 26. So um, Paul or Saul is on his way to Damascus, um, and we did this two weeks ago. You can go back and watch it on our YouTube or on our, um, you know, the iTunes or whatever it is. Um, But anyway, so uh, Saul is on his way to, to Damascus. He has this Damascus Road experience where Jesus shows up. He gives his life to Jesus. Um, Ananias comes and he baptizes him, and Paul begins his own Jesus journey. And then what we discovered last year is Luke did not put it in his writing here, but Paul actually went down to Arabia um, for three years. So he studied, I believe, quietly um, with the Lord Jesus on Mount Sinai, the place where God originally ratified the covenant between uh, the Jewish people and this one God, Yahweh. Um, And then he goes back to Damascus. Now, so he's now back in Damascus after going down to Arabia for three years. So let's pick up in verse 26 and see what happens now. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. So, so he now goes, he's back in Damascus after three years, and he goes from Damascus to where? Jerusalem, that's right. <clears throat> but they were afraid of him. Why were they afraid of him? Yeah, he'd been killing them. They probably had literally stood there and watched as he killed who? Stephen, that's right. You can go back in our messages if you want to hear that one. But not believing that he was really a disciple. Verse 27, but Barnabas, we're not going to talk a ton about Barnabas today, but we will in the future. He, in my opinion, is one of the great heroes in the book of Acts. And we'll talk more about that. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. Who are the apostles? The original 12, the dudes, the guys, the whatever. Um, and they had, remember, they'd added someone to take the place of Matthias. Now, when it says apostles, that means the original 12. When it says disciples, that means all followers of Jesus, men, women, everybody who had followed after him. Does that make sense? Okay. He told them how Saul, so Barnabas is telling the disciples now, the apostles, how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem. Now remember, he was trained in Jerusalem under Gamaliel. He had, he had probably grown up in many ways in Jerusalem. Um, so he's back into this city where a lot of people know him. So he's uh, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 29, he talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews. Now, in a, in a matter of speaking, this is um, what happens here in these next three verses is the story of Paul's entire life. Really interesting. When the believers, uh, let me go back to verse 29, he talked and he debated with the Hellenistic Jews, and every time Paul talks and debates, guess what happens? They try to kill him. 
But they tried to kill him. Verse 30. When, how would you like that? I mean, I'm just saying. We don't often think about how is he feeling. Every time he opens his mouth, he's like, all right, verse 30. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea, and that's a port city, and they sent him off to Tarsus. Now, this is where he's originally from. So they're like, man, we love you, but everybody is trying to kill you. You are making a mess here, and we're trying to have peaceful church. We like our comfortable chairs and our nice music. Do not mess us up. They stick him on a boat and send him where? Home, Tarsus. Verse 31, then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. So quick recap. Um, Paul comes to faith in Damascus. From Damascus, he goes down to Mount Sinai in Arabia for three years. After three years, he comes back to Damascus. That's reading between the lines of this coming out of um, Galatians 1 and 2, if you want to cross-reference that. Um, Then back to Damascus. From Damascus, he goes back down to Jerusalem, and then they send him to Tarsus. Now, Paul is now in his mid-30s. He could even be in his late 30s. We don't know exactly. But there is a silent decade So this is what it becomes so important. There is a silent decade in the life of the Apostle Paul. And here's what we don't know. We don't know what happened. But a lot of churches and a lot of Christians generally think that Paul, because of the way Luke wrote it, and, you know, I'll ask Luke when I get to heaven, why would you write it this way? But people assume that because Luke wrote it this way, the moment that the Apostle Paul becomes a Christian, what's he start doing? He did preach Jesus, but his ministry didn't launch for actually 13 years. 13 years. He goes down to Arabia for three, and then he goes back up to Tarsus, which is in Turkey. He goes there for 10 years. So it is 13 years before God releases the Apostle Paul into ministry. Now, here in America, when we find somebody who is like smart and, you know, looks okay and can speak okay, and we think they could probably build a church and we think they might love Jesus, guess what we do? Man, let's lift them up and let's put some cool colors and sounds and a big band behind them. And man, guess what happens? Church growth. And then if they don't have the inner character and formation to carry that, if they don't have the intimate relationship and walk with the Lord Jesus to carry the weight of that explosive growth, guess what often happens? And we're in the middle right now of even looking at this, what has happened in the megachurch movement in America over the last 30 years. So, Paul, so God, I think, sovereignly looks at this young apostle and he says, I am going to sequester you away and I am going to train you and form you and shape you and it's not going to always be fun and it's going to be for not one year or two years or three years, but 13. Now, what's really interesting, if we pause right here before I give you the four ways that God shaped him, um, is In the life of Joseph in the Old Testament, if you go read it, um, Joseph is 17 years old, and you'll have to read it, and you're going to have to trust me here, but he's 17 years old when he's sold by his brothers into um, slavery, and he makes his way to Egypt on um, a band of slave traders, I suppose. Um, And he then serves in a guy's house named Potiphar, and then he's accused of something, and he goes to jail for 10 years. So from The time Joseph is 17 till the time Joseph is promoted to the second in command in Egypt. How many years? 30 minus 17? 13! Now, here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that God always picks 13 years. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, in order for a person to be deeply formed in the ways of the Spirit, in order for them to become progressively more deeply acquainted with the Lord Jesus, in order for them to begin to know him fully and walk with him, developing trust and faith and intimacy, it takes time and years. Years. In fact, some of you may be sitting here thinking you might be our older uh, saints, um, those who are getting up in years, and you might go, well, maybe I'm too old for this. And I want to remind you of a guy that I love in the Old Testament by the name of, who knows where I'm going? Moses. Moses went into the desert at age 40, and he was called by God at age 80. Selah. 
Okay, so let's look at these four ways that God shapes the Apostle Paul. Uh, God is not a God of formulas. Anytime you go anywhere or get involved in a church or anything, and, and they, everybody says, this is the formula. Bing, 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 bing. God is not a God of formulas. Beware, you're on the brink of Phariseeism. I can promise you. God is a God of rhythms. He is a God of patterns. He is a God of, of um, just spiritual rhythms and how he develops people. And that's what I'm going to take a look at here. So in the life of Paul, um, formerly known as Saul, and in the life of Joseph, God issues a call. Number one way that God prepares the apostle Paul. He issues a call. We don't really know about Saul's childhood other than he gets sent from Tarsus down to Jerusalem to study under Gamaliel. And guess what? Gamaliel was the most famous of all the rabbis of the time. So you don't get sent from up there down to Jerusalem to study under Gamaliel unless you're an exceptional young person. So he had a sense from the time he was little of a call on his life to minister um, in the rabbinic tradition and in the Pharisee tradition. What's interesting about Joseph, if you read Genesis 37, is God shows up in Genesis 37 and Joseph, does anybody know, has a, a dream. He actually has two dreams. And Joseph, being the young, braggadocious, probably arrogant man that he is, immediately gets up. And what's he do with his 11 brothers? God has said, I'm going to be a great man. And you're going to bow down to me. If you don't know that story, just look it up and read it. But braggadocious, arrogant, young punk. And he tell, he's like almost the youngest. And he tells all his brothers what's up. And guess how they respond? We don't like you, and so we're going to pretend an animal killed you, and we're going to sell you to some slave traders. I mean, really, go read it. It's worth, it's worth read. But here's what always happens. God issues a call. Now, because God issues the call, does that mean the person's ready? Everybody say, heavens no. So what's the second thing God does? Number one, God issues a call. The second thing God does is he creates brokenness and dependence. God will not fully release a person into the ministry of the gospel in his kingdom until he has created brokenness and dependence. The only thing that we know about Paul's um, time in Tarsus, so it's 10 years, and we don't actually see um, Paul again in the book of Acts until I think it's 11, Acts 11.25, 11, if you want to look that up. But we don't see Paul again in the book of Acts until chapter 11, verse 25, when Barnabas comes and gets him. But the only thing we really know about these 10 silent years that, that happened in Tarsus are where Paul talks in 2 Corinthians 11 and 12. It's the only window into this silent decade where he talks about the thorn in his flesh. Now, I want to open up a door of Michael Mattis' conjecture. This is not Bible. I can't prove it. I can't demonstrate it, but it's at least a possibility. So, um, in Tarsus, it's a major metropolitan city. All the religions, all the you know, culture of Rome operate art, beauty, architecture, language, science, writings, even theater, violence, all the sexual sin that went along with all the other religions, emperor worship. So, it is here that God decides to shape the apostle Paul. So he's back to his childhood place. Now, when most of us as Christians, um, and I'm getting to this uh, idea that comes from 2 Corinthians 11 and 12 and God creating brokenness and dependence in Paul, but when most of us as Christians think about Paul, what do we think of? It's probably libraries, a guy that wrote, maybe like a theologian. He, like, he probably had a nice office, right? I mean, he studied all the time. All he did was spend all his time studying scrolls, right? Not so. What almost certainly happened is that Paul went back to um, Tarsus, the place where he grew up, and he, his dad would have been a Pharisee, and Pharisees supported themselves with a side job, and his dad's side job was tent making. So Paul shows up in Tarsus, and what does he begin to do? Make tents. So let me tell you how this 10 years probably looks. Is he spent most of the time in this little cramped workshop, right? It's smelly and it's hot and it's arid. And he is working with his hands and he's probably bent over. And he's pounding leather and punching leather. And he's sewing leather and he's making tents. And while he is doing this, what is most likely ruminating inside of him is the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. He's reviewing it. He's going through it. He's thinking through. And I would actually prepare 
propose to you that as God is creating brokenness and dependence inside of the Apostle Paul, he is also walking through and he is learning to see Jesus in all of the Old Testament. And I would propose to you that the, the lion's share of Paul's waking hours in this 10 years in Tarsus is not spent on a stage or preaching to people or showing people the way or baptizing people or performing signs and wonders. No, no, no. The lion's share of the time was actually spent hunched over a workbench, sewing tents, tanning leather, making these tents, and then selling them to people who came in and talked to him. And I would actually propose to you that probably the main thing and the main way that Paul shared Jesus in these years is that he was bent over and people came in and talk to him in his workshop. Not glamorous, not on YouTube, not having an Instagram follower. You know, you hear what I'm saying? I mean, he is forging, and we could even flip that here for a minute, and I would say to us, to you, to me, don't despise your workshop, your landscaping business, your mail truck, we could fill in the blank, right? Don't despise it. God has likely called you to carry your cross in and through those things so that he can develop you, shape you, and ultimately release you. So Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 11 and 12, about the only window we have in this Tarsus decade, about this thorn in his flesh. And I just want to open this for just a minute because I think it's at least worth understanding. And part of the way I would believe and suggest that God created some brokenness and dependence in Paul. Because in Paul, we get this um, dichotomy. On one hand, he has such like triumphant joy in the kingdom of heaven. But on the other hand, there's like a sadness and a soberness about his writings. And I would suggest to you that it's at least possible that the thorn in Paul's flesh Flesh, is he excitedly, as a mid 30 year old, carried Jesus home in his heart to go see his dad, who was probably also zealous, like we looked at a few weeks ago, for the things of the kingdom, who would have been a Pharisee, and to his mom, and possibly to his siblings, and possibly to a wife who may have even had kids. And when he arrived and he began to share Jesus with all these people that uh, he loved deeply, it is at least possible that they said, And what he actually experienced in that silent decade is the rejection, perhaps, this is conjecture, of a father, of a mother, of siblings, of friends, of the synagogue that he grew up in. And he went from being this massively respected person to this guy that made tents and talked crazy. And it may be that that thorn in his flesh was actually that he had a family and he never mentions it. Like in none of his writings, other than 2 Corinthians 11 and 12, do we have any glimpse into Paul's silent decade. And he, I mean, obviously he wants it to remain silent. He doesn't even speak about it. So number one, God issues a call. The second thing God always does is he creates brokenness and dependence. The third thing God does is he cultivates intimacy by developing faith and trust. I would propose to you this morning that God in the life of Paul cultivated intimacy over that tent making leather work bench. And Paul began not to experience the grandiose signs and wonders of God, but he began to learn to abide in the presence of Yahweh, studying, thinking through, reciting Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, looking at the Old Testament, looking at the Proverbs and, and the prophets. If we looked at the life of Joseph, I would say the same thing. Joseph is sitting in jail for years. He's in Potiphar's house for years. And God is cultivating intimacy. And God cannot cultivate intimacy with a human until he has created brokenness and dependence. If we looked at the life right here of Paul from a Western American perspective, we get in a rush for everything, aren't we? I mean, we want it now. What's the fast food restaurant that goes your way, right? It's Burger King, isn't it? We want it now. And if you looked at it from a Western perspective, did Paul waste 13 years? Uh, he could have been planting churches and writing books. He could have been out preaching, right? He could have been leading people to Jesus. He could have led Billy Graham crusades. And instead, what did he do? 
hunched over making tents because God was cultivating inside of him a heart of brokenness and dependence and building an intimate relationship with him. The last thing that I would say to you, God issues a call. God creates brokenness and dependence. God cultivates an intimate relationship by developing faith and trust. And then God entrusts and empowers wildly. Here's what I mean. For Paul in Acts 11.25, Barnabas actually comes to Tarsus after 10 years and gets Paul and escorts Paul. And I think in heaven, Barnabas gets the credit for getting Paul back into ministry. So Barnabas comes and gets Paul and drags him um, into ministry. And then all of the sudden, you see this elevation step by step of the Apostle Paul because God all of a sudden has forged the deep inner character. The fruit of the Spirit is being developed, the deep inward formation of Jesus. And now God says, it's time. I'm ready. If we looked at the life of Joseph, you can see in Genesis 41 when Pharaoh, the most powerful in all the world, calls Joseph from the prison and has him come into his very presence. And he has a dialogue with him and Pharaoh asks Joseph to interpret a dream. And Joseph says, I can't do it, but I know a God that can. And that level of dependence and humility where he doesn't go, I can do it. He goes, I can't do it, but God can. And then all of a sudden, God empowers and entrusts Joseph to be the most powerful person on the face of the known world at the time. So let's tie this all together. Martin Lloyd-Jones said the most dangerous thing or the worst thing that can happen to a person is that they would succeed before they're ready. God shapes the Apostle Paul. God shapes Joseph. God shapes you. God shapes me by issuing a call, by developing brokenness and dependence, by cultivating an intimate, abiding relationship, and then by entrusting and empowering wildly. Lord Jesus and band, you can come as I pray. As we move towards communion this morning, I pray that we would allow, you would allow us to see you as the God who moves us through dark places, valleys that have the shadow of death over us in order to forge us and shape us and make us and entrust us and then wildly empower us, not just here in planet earth, but also for eternity. Lord Jesus, as we stand and as we share and break bread as a body, I pray that you'd be glorified and I pray that we would worship you in Jesus' name, amen. If you're not a Christian here and you're not comfortable taking communion, feel free to hang in your seat. If you're anywhere in your Jesus journey and you want to, join us for the Lord's Supper. I know the tension of the night. I don't always understand. I don't always get to see. Lord, all I
Father, as we get ready to celebrate the Lord's Supper, the supper that you instituted, Father, I pray that we could appropriate the very life, death, resurrection, and coronation of King Jesus into our being. And I, Father, I pray that every bit of the life of Christ could live in us and through us. Beloved, as you take and eat and drink today, don't do it remembering where you've failed or where you have fallen. Do it instead remembering where the victorious life of King Jesus is strong where you are weak. Amen. Take and eat and drink. Let's stand and sing that chorus again, and then I'll pray us out. Father, as we go today, may we sense your face shining upon us. Father, may we become more intimately and deeply acquainted with your person and presence. Holy Spirit, would you help us abide in you, knowing you, listening for your still, small voice. And Father, in the areas where people feel uh, hurt or downcast because of the difficulties of life, Father, would you allow us to raise our gaze and see them through the kingdom lens of eternity? Father, I pray that as we go, that your purpose, your presence, your will, and your way would rule and reign in our lives. Lord, we love you because you loved us. Amen and amen.